Hello, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending where you're joining us from in the world today. We appreciate your presence for our presentation today, Building Brain-Friendly Organizations Through Effective Leadership, presented by Professor Rick Gilkey of Emory University's Goizueta Business School in collaboration with Ivy Exec. My name is Niyata Bensiential. I'm the Senior Content Manager here at Ivy Exec, part of the Higher Ed team, and I'll be helping to moderate today's session. Before we begin, I do want to review a few quick housekeeping items with the audience. First, all attendees are currently in listen-only mode. However, we do encourage you to participate in the session by asking questions to the presenter, which you can do using the question box in your GoToWebinar control panel, found on either left or right-hand side of your screen. We do encourage questions during the presentation, and we'll also have a formal Q&A session at the end following the main presentation. In addition, we are recording today's session, and you can look forward to receiving a copy of the presentation uh, recording via email in the coming days. And now I'd like to introduce uh, today's presenter, uh, Rick Gilkey, Professor Rick Gilkey. Uh, he holds a joint appointment at Emory University as professor in the practice organization management at the Goizueta Business School, and is also a professor of psychiatry and behavioral sciences in the School of Medicine. He earned his graduate degrees from Harvard University and University of Michigan. And with that, I'd like to turn things over to Rick to take it away from here. Okay, thank you, Niasu. Well, I'm looking forward to uh, spending this time with all of you, and uh, this will start as a presentation, but I hope it ends as a conversation. Uh, it's a topic that's near and dear to many of us, both at Goizueta Business School and here in the School of Medicine. Um, and uh, the, the topic, let me begin, building brain-friendly organizational environments through effective leadership. Uh, to start with, we'll just simply define the working definition that many of us have of what leadership is which is the ability to build an environment where everyone can achieve their potential. And believing in that, then what we're really trying to understand is how can leaders create climates and cultures and organizations where people go to work in the morning, excited to get there, are fully engaged when they're there and are learning and growing. And at the end of the day, they wonder where their time went. And when they get home, they wanna talk about work rather than forget about it. And uh, so that the tension between who we are, you are and what you do um, is very, very minimal. Work, therefore, is a form of, of self-expression and a fulfilling one at that. So with that kind of in mind uh, and thinking about how we change organizations with a paradigm that invokes more biological models, at the end of the day, we are biological creatures. How do we uh, create a place where our hearts and minds and brains can coalesce uh, to build something together, uh, a place where we all want to be and with products and services that are in, uh, in desired mode by everyone. And uh, so to, to move into that kind of uh, space, I want to invoke uh, Roger Spiri, who was uh, one of the researchers who brought so much of this uh, to us. And uh, he, his sentiments are mine in being with you guys today. He did the work on hemispheric functioning in the brain, and uh, as you can see, won a Nobel Peace Prize doing so. Uh, one of his key findings that uh, is really inspiring and illuminating for those of us working in organizations and leadership area um, is, uh, well, it looks like I'm locked here. Let's see, okay, let me this again, move this, there we go. Uh, when the brain is whole, the unified consciousness of the, of the left and right hemisphere adds up to more than the individual properties of the separate hemispheres. As human beings, we are more than the sum of our parts. And for that reason, we have the capacity to transcend ourselves, to learn through our whole lifespan, to grow and to help others do that. Uh, my own inspiration for this in a personal way came from a time when I was a visiting professor at INSEAD in Fontainebleau, France. Uh, and Percy Varnavik was the kind of reigning CEO. He was the Jack Welch of, of Europe, leading ABB, S.A.A. Brown Bavari. And remember, I remember doing interviews with him with some of my colleagues there. And we asked him, at what point in making the transition to CEO of this large, uh, well-respected global corporation, at what point did he become clear or clearer about his role as CEO? And he described it very well. He said, I came into a factory. He's from Sweden. The factory was in Sweden. He looked around. He saw people he knew. He saw their immense talents. One of them, he said, was building a summer home with his own hands. Another one was running a major summer theater productions uh, in Göteborg for the summer. Uh, another one was writing a book. And but when he looked at them at work, they were doing these very narrow jobs in a repetitive kind of way. 
And he suddenly realized that what he really needed to do is create an environment where the whole person could come to work and be engaged. And uh, I remember at one point he recalled an old vaudeville routine uh, that was on the American stage. And uh, in this, uh, a, a guest is being escorted around a large corporation, a Dilbert-like setting. And uh, they walk into a room with hundreds of desks and cubicles and the guest is really impressed and he turns to the host and said, this is amazing, how many people work here? And the host thought for a moment and said, well, probably about half. Uh, well, that was the prompt or the example Barnabic used to say, my job as CEO is to get the whole person and all everybody uh, fully engaged in participating. So that's sort of the backdrop of what we're gonna talk about. Um, here's the overview. I wanna spend just a few minutes uh, introducing you or reintroducing you to your brain, and there's some great news in this for you. I talk a little bit about the biology of business, uh, that we, again, we run organizations as if the people in them were already robots. That's maybe a transition that's happening, but we are human beings first, and uh, the implications of that we understand in terms of science, but don't practice in terms of business. Uh, a little bit about business development versus talent development. And that gets very personal because as we're trying to grow businesses, uh, we focus on our metrics, on our performance, what we're trying to achieve and how we're gonna be evaluated for incentive systems and promotion. But the other metric is a more important one, I'd argue, and that is, are you learning and growing? What's your agenda for that? And our hope is that organizations will focus more on that uh, and less on the specific metrics of a given day. And then I'll talk a little bit about what do we know about brain-friendly organizational environments. This is a term that we actually coined here at Emory. Uh, and because we realized that if we could create environments that were more free from the politics of personalities and the stress uh, and that people could work on their actual roles and what they're trying to contribute strategically, um, that we could engage them and create a more fulfilling work environment. And so that term uh, was then taken up by David Rock and the Neural Leadership Institute. We were very grateful about that. And they actually held a summit uh, on that topic and they continue to look at various elements of building brain-friendly environments, including environments of diversity, of inclusiveness, and environments that are feedback rich. Uh, we know that the brain is feedback dependent. Walt Disney put it well, you can't learn from experiences you're not having. So giving a people an opportunity where they have the safety and security of an environment that's focused on developing them, then they can take feedback in a very different way. And the mantra that's come out of uh, the Neural Leadership Institute is, don't give feedback, ask for feedback, that we should be driving that process as learners and as growing human beings. And last, about effective leadership. This is about changing mindsets, a different mentality, a different approach, a different map as we're building brains and growing people. Um, so a little bit about your brain. The two most remarkable discoveries in my lifetime um, and in yours, uh, therefore, um, are neurogenesis. Uh, when I took the board eons ago, um, you would uh, not do, do very well if you thought that neurons regenerated or there was any process that cells uh, grow, um, and then if they're used, they continue to exist. If they don't, they die, and when they die, that's it, end of game. Uh, we now know that that's not true, and while we don't understand it fully, and there's some controversy around this, but by most of the metrics that we use to assess uh, neurogenesis, so we're generating somewhere around 10,000 new neurons a day. Half of those are daughter cells that keep the process going, um, but then we have this building account where we get more and more neurons and the capacity to grow learn. Uh, and it's revolutionized a number of fields, um, particularly uh, rehab medicine, where we no longer bypass parts of the brain that were damaged, but we try to work them uh, more and rebuild those parts of the brain. We have a whole program here with uh, veterans uh, dealing with PTSD, where we are trying to, in effect, regrow damaged uh, brains so that they can function again at the level close to perhaps where they were before. The other part of this that's fascinating, and when I raised the question of what do you want to do with all those neurons, this would be like having money in a bank account and not planning to do anything with it. It's an asset. 
Um, do you want to learn a new language? Uh, do you want to develop a new hobby? What do you want to do? Expand your capabilities at work or use it in your personal life? Um, the good news in this is that there are over 100 billion neurons in the brain, as you know. Um, and the connectivity of your brain is rather extraordinary. Any one of those neurons can connect into one of 10,000 different networks. It's the ultimate learning network machine. Um, so the connectivity of the brain is expressed by the number 10 to the power of, that's one, followed by a million zeros. It's the most complex apparatus in the known universe, and you own one. So there's the good news for you. Um, the um, as we, as we think about this, there's also another element of this um, that you can see, by the way, graphically. This is some work done by Baron in Israel, and it's basically saying we are programmed to grow, to learn, and develop. This is the growth uh, in individuals over the lifespan in emotional intelligence. We think IQ is relatively fixed. It changes, migrates in its form, but its capacities remain roughly the same through the life cycle, we think. Um, but IQ or EQ, rather, emotional intelligence is quite another matter. Uh, and what you see in this chart, which is a little difficult to see, but what you'll see is that curve. That's what counts. The 100 in the middle is just the average. They're averaging it like IQ at 100. And uh, we are not doing very well as teenagers and even as young adults. But as we gain more social experience and more interactions, uh, we make huge gains in emotional intelligence. Uh, the only uh, exception to that is in the studies that he did of people over 50, what's interesting about this is the good news is it's not bio biologically driven, we think, it's socially driven, that if you look at executive populations, uh, what you'll see with executives is more and more privilege, uh, more position, more rank, and more isolation. Uh, they're interacting with fewer people that are different than themselves, they're in the uh, executive suite, in the C-suite, and uh, that's a very dangerous place to be, uh, neurologically speaking, if you will. So I think we're going to learn a lot more. And I have a colleague here at Emory who's writing, a, uh, a, doing great studies on healthy aging and ways of not disconnecting and not becoming a victim of your privilege, if you will, and your prerogatives, um, but continuing to learn, grow, and develop. In fact, at one point, Jack Welch mandated that all of his uh, senior executives have a mentor who's less than 20 years, 20, 29 years of age, uh, because they needed to understand more about social media and see the world in a different way. So uh, the capacity to learn and grow and develop is built in. That's the main point here. And we need to create organizations that facilitate that is the argument. Um, the other side of the story, however, is that the brain also has uh, extraordinary limitations. The most famous paper in American psychology, arguably, was George Miller's paper. It's called The Magic Number Seven. Uh, I think it was plus or minus three. Uh, and uh, no, actually, plus or minus two, sorry. Um, but what we realize now is that we, the brain cannot keep track, in his view, of more than nine things um, and probably more likely four or five. By the way, the magic number seven is typically the number of digits in a phone number uh, around the globe. Uh, and uh, so this is the, um, the quandary. This is the paper, uh, our limits on processing information. This, by the way, as I sometimes quick, is, uh, may explain some of the difficulties with assimilating the Ten Commandments uh, way beyond our capacity. So the limit of seven, um, if I give you these letters in this seemingly random order, it would be very, very difficult for you to memorize them quickly and, uh, and respond. What does your brain do? It chunks them. It organizes them um, into manageable pieces. And so if you look at this more carefully, you see GM, UPS, TWA, SAS, and so forth. I shouldn't leave IBM out, should I? So uh, that capacity to simplify things is, allows us to master more information but and protect us from information overload. Uh, the risk in that, of course, is that sometimes we come up with the wrong chunks uh, or the wrong conclusions and oversimplify things. The, the difficulty for the brain and our Achilles heel, if you will, um, is stress. Here's what we know about stress. This is arguably uh, the most famous chart in social science. Uh, Dan Goldman certainly sa says that, and I, I think he's right. And what it says, as you can see from the bell curve, is that stress 
um, on the left side of the curve motivates us. This is when we're pumped. It's kind of the good adrenaline, if you will, and we're inspired and we're trying to achieve something beyond anything we've done before. That's the self-transcending kind of function, if you will. 90% of leadership theory is about that left side, how to inspire people. But equally important is the right side of the curve, where there's an overload point, a tipping point, and we go over that, and what we experience um, is not inspiration, uh, not motivation, but anxiety. And the problem with this, at a point where we are most anxious and the stress is the greatest, we need to have the most innovative capacities and adaptive abilities at our disposal. And the result of it, unfortunately, is that biology overrides all that and we get threat rigidity behavior, which you know as the flight, fight, or avoidance response, uh, which is great in the jungle if there's a poisonous snake after you, um, but is terrible in the corporate jungle. Uh, when you have an angry boss or a disaffected client or customer. Uh, the, the key to this is giving people control. So as we talk through some of these slides, you're going to see pieces of what is involved in creating um, a brain-friendly environment. The key issue here is probably most easily described from research done on stressful occupations. And specifically, one study that is kind of uh, emblematic of all of them in my view, which is the Indianapolis 500 races. Um, these are race car drivers, as you know, probably going 230 miles an hour around a closed circular track. And uh, they measured their levels of glucocorticoids. And so they were able in galvanic skin response, many different metrics. And universally, the most stressful time during that race, uh, and I usually do this as a pop quiz and question and question and answer kind of thing, but we won't do it in this format. So I'll give you the answer. The most stressful time for those drivers is not when they're driving 240 miles an hour. That's a day at the office. Uh, for them, it's when they're in the pit stop. And if you think about it for a moment, the reason is obvious, and that is uh, they don't have control. And for them, that's the, uh, that, that's the uh, Achilles heel again. And this is true for all of us. If we don't have a sense of control, uh, then we go over the top and we're on the right side of that curve where there is anxiety and uh, the oxygen is flowing into not our brains where we need it, but in our large muscles for flight or fight. It again is very adaptive, but not in the human environment. And the other critical point of it, it was designed for a real emergency. It wasn't meant to be triggered every day. So, um, the problem with this then becomes obvious and this next one, I'm not going to show the the video, but it's just a prompt for me, and that is it's a video of a young student in a lab with a professor who um, I happen to know uh, of, and he's a, a great person, so it's a very comfortable situation, that's the point. And um, he hooks her up to a heart rate measures and a galvanic skin response, and you can see the instruments recording her levels of, of stress as it's measured by those two categories. And he plays just some, scary music from a horror movie and she's sitting there calmly and it looks fine and she could be sitting in an office um, what she doesn't know is that her amygdala has been triggered radical response the instruments go almost off the charts uh, again galvanic skin response heart rate goes up and she's not even conscious of it and the point is we are very sensitive to stress and it doesn't have to be dramatic uh, it doesn't have to be life-threatening uh, it can be simply a, an unfriendly, hostile work environment or one that is neglectful uh, that can create these uh, outcomes. Uh, another example of this uh, with fMRI scans, if you take someone, put them in an fMRI machine and you show them a series of faces, happy, sad, whatever, the minute you show them an angry face, uh, the amygdala activates. Um, so let's talk about the amygdala here. Um, by the way, these are described in low stress as in uh, entitlement organizations. High uh, earning are the ones where you're optimal, you're pumped, you're involved, you're motivated, but you're not overstressed. And as I mentioned, also, we have anxiety. Uh, describe that. So your amygdala, a small part of the brain, an ancient part of the brain designed for one thing primarily, and that is to allow you to survive. It's your homeland security system. Uh, it works fast with minimal data, so you are reacting, you're not thinking or processing, and that's okay because it's designed for the jungle and it prompts those flight-fight responses and can get you in lots of trouble. 
um, attacking a boss or a client is never a good idea. What triggers it? Um, we have a slide out of order. Well, first, condescension, lack of respect, being treated unfairly. We think about these, these are not life-threatening. I'll just put these down, unappreciated. We know that feedback needs to be in a ratio, positive to negative, about four to one. If you've got someone you're working with that you wanna retain and grow and develop, uh, there should be a ratio of about four positives because we don't necessarily know our strengths. That's one of the points. Um, at home, by the way, that ratio is more like five to one. Feeling like you're not being listened to or heard. Again, these don't sound like they're violent kinds of things that would trigger the amygdala, um, but they do. And then being held to unrealistic demands uh, is uh, clearly another one. So um, but the number four, not being listened to, the thing we know in terms of brain-friendly organizations that are fundamentals are giving people two things. One, a voice, and number two, impact. Um, if you don't have either of those or both of them, uh, you are a diminished person at work. Uh, you have a certain sense of futility, uh, and it's very, very demotivating, as we know. Um, unrealistic deadlines, particularly if you didn't have any voice in setting those deadlines, are deadly. Just to look at the first one via The New Yorker, one of my favorite cartoons, Condescension, Lack of Respect. Again, not violent, but look what happens. This is keep up the good work, whatever it is, whoever you are. Um, being a kind of anonymous person in an organization without any kind of recognition um, is a debilitating condition long term. And so Mr. Big here, this is our anti-leader, by the way. Um, what this at the extreme takes the form of our uh, extreme jobs uh, from a book of the same title that really captures many of the things that we think we've found in our neuroimaging studies. These are jobs that often require 60 hours of work with at least um, some of the following characteristics. Unpredictable flow of work, uh, that was 91% of their participants uh, 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 excuse me, defined that as one of the uh, challenges that was debilitating for them. Um, and again, think about the issue of control here. They don't have, uh, and perhaps no one appears to have control, and that may be a badly designed organization or processes. Fast-paced work, tight deadlines, all of this sounds familiar to all of you, I'm sure, from one experience or another. Inordinate scope of responsibility, more than one job. If you go into a room now of executives in an executive leadership meeting or conference and say, how many people are doing a job that was done previously by uh, two people or maybe three, the vast majority of hands are gonna go up. Work-related events outside regular work hours. We know that increasingly the people who are getting promoted are not so much extroverts, but introverts. And we don't know why that is, although the, their introspective capacity to, to learn and to reflect uh, may be part of what's being selected unconsciously in organizations. Uh, but think of the stress that creates if the way that you re-energize yourself and recharge your batteries or reboot is to get some private time. What happens then when your job is one which is requiring a, a tremendous amount of outside activity and socializing. Uh, having that kind of availability to clients 24 seven sounds good, but it really isn't in the client's best interest either. Uh, profit and loss responsibility. Um, I always think in academia that one of the things all of us as professors should have as an experience is p &L responsibility, being responsible for payroll. Having done that once, um, I, I know. Uh, large amounts of travel. Uh, I came in last night on a red eye, so I, and you've probably done the same thing. Uh, and we know that travel is less and less fun with all due respect to Delta that does a great job in general. Uh, physical presence at the workplace at least 10 hours a day. Also a, a very draining and perhaps in many cases not really necessary. Um, so let's turn then to the topic at hand. Um, this is, uh, again, extreme jobs, the uh, dangerous allure of the 70-hour work week. By the way, the physiology of this is interesting because uh, what's counterintuitive here is that people can get addicted to these kinds of worlds. Um, it's kind of a an adrenaline rush and that can be associated with it. And we know people can get essentially addicted to their own adrenaline, and uh, that's not a long-term winning proposition. So um, we've already defined leadership uh, as the ability to build these environments where everyone can achieve their potential. 
shifting from, again, industrial to biological models, um, we find first that it's orchestrated, it's not commanded. Uh, this is a participative management and participative leadership. Uh, and only in emergency or in situations where you have to make an unpopular decision uh, does it become a totally one-way top-down proposition. It is connected, building flexible information-rich networks uh, where the barriers are minimized and the disconnects are uh, removed. It is resonant uh, that you don't have harmony for the sake of harmony. In fact, you can have enormous amounts of conflict, but you have ways of resolving them uh, while people are maintaining their respect for each other. And uh, organizations, uh, MailChimp is a good example, has put a lot of resources into the whole issue of how do we deal with conflict uh, so that we can disagree without being disagreeable and that we can turn our disagreements into problem solving sessions where we're listening more than talking and resolving things in the best interests of our clients and our organizations. Um, it's performance based. The brain is a meritocracy. If I give you a math problem right now, there's certain neural networks that will activate. There's not gonna be a battle about, well, the auditory system really wants to take over and that that should be their domain. You know, you don't get partisan battles inside your brain. Your brain knows very quickly where to go to, to for whatever it needs. Um, it also is an environment of instantaneous feedback. And that's related to the conflict management. If the conflict is such a challenge and an organization is conflict challenged, if you will, it's very difficult um, for people to give each other feedback, positive and negative, actually. It's also improvisational. It's adaptive. Um, and you're able to um, be responsive in the moment and anticipate, which really is a uh, a skill set that we've seen in some of these environments that we're describing as more brain friendly. Um, and that is finally it's reflective, that learns from successes and failures. And failure is a topic that can be discussed. And you've all heard the line fail forward and fail fast, uh, that is taken as an opportunity for learning. And the AAR is uh, actually from the military where they work on this every single day. Um, particularly in combat areas like Afghanistan and Iraq, the after action review. So no matter how beaten up they are at the end of the day, they come back and talk about, well, what worked, what didn't work, what are we gonna do differently? What did we learn from this? Um, and uh, you get the picture. So um, to continue, um, these kinds of environments build expertise, uh, sometimes described as flow, less energy, higher performance. And some of this is because you're trying to de-emphasize and remove even, if you will, the psychopolitics that drives most organizations. Uh, one of the classic works in psychoanalysis uh, was by um, Zelensky. And he, um, he talked about how in an article called Zelensky, I'm sorry, Abe Zelensky, who talked about uh, in an article that is again, classic real work, that if you look inside of most organizations, you're gonna see most of the energy consumed by what he calls psychopolitics, the personalities, the one-upsmanship, trying to look good, uh, trying to avoid embarrassment. A lot of energy goes into that. And we think that organizations that are brain friendly, uh, or Bob Kagan talks about them as deliberately developmental organizations, really you quit your second job, which is looking good, and you really focus on learning and performing. Uh, these organizations support risk-taking, novelty-seeking, uh, and challenging orthodoxies. Uh, I've always been fond of Gary Hamill's notion that most organizations have more to fear from their own internal orthodoxies than from their competitors. Uh, so having the space and safety uh, and the safe zones to be able to challenge and raise questions and potentially embarrassing ones um, ends up being a huge asset. Uh, MIT studies talked about the, these environments as being practice oriented and mistake tolerant. Uh, I love the practice oriented. Leadership and management are one of a very few professions, if you think about it, in which you don't necessarily get the practice. You think about sports, you know, a great soccer player or a great baseball player or football, whatever your sport is. Uh, you think about it, any 
accomplished team and professional will spend estimated 85 to 95 percent of their time practicing. That's obvious. But what should be obvious but isn't apparently is that when you go to work, how many times does somebody meet you at the door and say, okay, today's a practice round. You know, try a few new things. We hope it works out. If it doesn't, don't worry about it. It's a practice round. It doesn't really count. Uh, the brain needs places to do that, uh, to repeat and learn in these cycles that we're wired to uh, benefit from um, and yet every day you go in it's a tournament it's competition um, and in fact every day counts and that's not a way to uh, nurture a growing brain or a learning mind uh, the other element of this is it's exploratory the walkabout uh, seeing what the options are and then being able to synthesize though when Ann Mulcahy uh, took over Xerox Corporation that I think at the time was about $2 billion um, in the red. Uh, she went to Warren Buffett hoping he might invest, knowing he wouldn't, which he didn't. But what she said was that I got something more valuable than the money. I got his advice. And what he said to me was, get out of Xerox, talk to customers, talk to competitors, look at products, go to trade shows, uh, the walkabout which is what the Australian Aborigines do as a part of their rite of passage into adulthood, as you know. And uh, she said that was invaluable. It really taught me about my own company and my own environment and what was wrong and what we needed to fix. Um, and that kind of freedom to explore and learn and then bring back the lessons um, should be built in and hardwired, we think, into brain-friendly organizations. Um, related to that is uh, brain-friendly executive thinking, where you look at either or. Uh, and uh, it's described sometimes as the opposable mind or polarity reasoning. And that is you look at short term and long term, strategic, tactical, those aren't either ors, you gotta do both. And we believe that a brain that is free from some of the stress of politics uh, and pressure that are related to metrics that may or may not be strategic uh, is, is a, a critical element of all this. And then respecting other people's time. Sony has a great pra practice in their creative uh, parts of their industry, and that is that when people come into work, and probably all of us can identify with this, we go into work and we actually have some ideas about what we want to accomplish. And that game plan lasts for approximately 27 seconds until we encounter the first person or more likely the first email. And then suddenly we are in a reactive mode, um, oftentimes with a fair amount of stress and we lose track of what it was we were trying to accomplish and we're thrown off our game. And what Sony did is keep people off of the inter internet, off of emails uh, for most of the morning. And what they learn later is that the level of um, innovation and performance in general went up on all scales. Um, there's cubicle studies that say if you decorate somebody's office space for them, they're going to be less productive than if you let them do it themselves. Again, there's an element of control in this. Um, and we've talked already or mentioned already the need for opinions. You, you have to have a voice. You have to have impact. Uh, nowhere has that been learned faster, I think, than in the military. And the uh, note I have here is the Fallujah Patrol. This was a group of Marines in Iraq. And the game has changed so radically because the military is operating with a new paradigm, and that is that warfare is no longer between nations. It's between nation and network, like Al-Qaeda. Uh, and um, so in one particular patrol, uh, they went out uh, near Fallujah. They saw a mule with a couple of guys. Something allowed them to uh, see that there was something wrong with this. That's called pattern recognition in the brain. This just was outside of the pattern of what appeared to be normal. So they approached them and sure enough, these guys dropped down on their knees and started firing at the Marines. Um, they took out one of them, but another one escaped and there was the mule with a saddlebag on. Um, they checked the saddlebag and of course it was filled with munitions. Um, the normal command for the officer to give at that point is okay, clear, we get out of here before snipers come in, uh, but he was contravened his order politely by the newest recruit, um, a farm kid from Missouri, I think he was 19 years old, and said, sir, I think we should stay. The officer listens and says, why? He said, well, you know, I'm a farm kid. I know about mules. If we stay here, this mule is going to get thirsty and he knows where to go and we should follow him. That's precisely what happened. So the mule goes off to wherever they had originated from. 
And so now we have a Humvee and a whole military crew, probably a million dollar operation under the command of a mule wandering through the back streets of Fallujah. Uh, the mule gets to a house and in that house was the other guy who escaped um, and more munitions. And it was obviously a center, an operation center uh, for the insurgents. Again, the, the emphasis here is de-emphasizing role and listening and giving people impact. Um, this is Bob Keegan's, um, I'm not gonna cover all these, but just a few points that kind of reinforce some of this. Um, employees, and some of these points are very much, you'll see similar to our own. Employees spend a lot of time hiding their weaknesses, covering up mistakes. Um, in a developmental organization, a deliberately developmental or brain friendly, you learn from your mistakes, you develop through your whole lifetime, and you live in a trusting environment where you can give and receive feedback. Um, and it gives people a lot of visibility into decision making. And therefore, uh, it's a huge issue in terms of succession planning because you've got people who have been exposed to high levels of um, information. I'm going to move ahead here quickly and um, well this is an interesting one and we'll, we'll, we'll touch on one of the things that we learned from our own studies is um, that the people who seem to be capable of building these environments routinely had great sense of humor um, and this is a, a verification if you will or validation from another source uh, from uh, Goldman and Boyatz's and McKee study uh, I'll you can read this, but they got the interviewer in. These were interviews that were actually conducted. The backstory is these were interviews that were conducted, I'm told, at Agon Zender. These were for jobs that were like the presidents of business units of uh, General Electric. So the high stakes, high pressure, big jobs. And so they videotaped the interviews uh, with the executive recruiters and did a content analysis. And you can see the results that leaders got interviewers uh, to laugh with them twice as often as just average executives. And success was defined by two elements. They were in the top third of bonuses reflecting financial performance, and they were rated as excellent by 90% of their bosses. So the success, the correlation here was between the ability to keep your cool, maintain a sense of humor, create an environment that was enjoyable for other people, uh, and that was reflected again in outcomes. Another study, I think that, well, here's the New Yorker version of this. I've always loved this. Uh, it was a wonderful report, Bob, a wonderful, wonderful report. This is the vice president of secure, of uh, sincerity, rather. Um, and by the way, <clears throat> from another study done by, by Jag Sheff here at Emory um, and David Wolf, uh, firms of endearment, uh, and I'll just read their conclusion. Far-sighted, tolerant, humane, and practical CEOs returned 758% over 10 years versus 128% for the S&P 500. So they were making the case again of, you know, being a human being first and being a C-suite executive as a secondary process here. Yeah, and there's the, uh, there's the, the stats. Um, let me move as we're moving towards a time of conclusion here towards, um, there we go. Um, and some other characteristics of this. And then um, in a couple of minutes, what I'd like to do is just uh, open this up to uh, questions and I will show you one other um, model. I think one thing I would not be a good professor if I didn't give you a homework assignment, but if you look at any kind of research that factors in, in terms of talent management, human development, uh, employee development, different models and data that tell us what seems to work. You're going to find, I think, a remarkable uh, convergence. Uh, the um, now focus on your strengths. Uh, the Gallup work looks at 10 factors that are related to productivity, uh, employee retention, customer uh, satisfaction, and profitability. These all are going to track and sound similar to for example, Bob Kagan's 10 characteristics of a deliberately developmental organization. Um, here are some of the things that we think psychologically is very much a part of, of leaders who build these kinds of organization. Um, the leaders who balance legitimate narcissism with altruism. Uh, in one study where people derailed, a number of them were described as self-made men who worship their creators. This kind of narcissistic approach to leadership just doesn't correlate uh, with building an environment that's conducive to other people thriving, if you will. 
Uh, another example is this Charles Schwab organization. Uh, strategy gurus like Gary Hamill were studying how was it that Schwab was able to move faster than any of their competitors in building websites that allowed their customers to engage, make trades, and interact with their staff. Um, and their, one of their interesting uh, takeaways was that at that time, Charles Schwab was the only organization that they could find that had empathy as a core value. Uh, and the response that they got when they asked the people at Schwab, how did you do that? And they said, well, we didn't know really what we were doing necessarily, um, but we knew it was the right thing to do for our customers. And so we just kept on going. Um, these environments are also regenerative and resilient. Uh, they recover from setbacks. Um, that's a whole other topic. And maybe the last and the most important part of this is that they're purposeful. And uh, just a very brief story. Uh, during the height of the Vietnam War, a couple of different campuses were shut down in all of the protests. And Columbia was one, Harvard was the other. And at Harvard, when they shut down Harvard Hall, which was the administration building, and another building, Andover Hall, that was administration as well. Um, and two people went to work that day. Nathan Pusey, who was the president of Harvard and operated as the old time leader. He was very impressed with his position and his power. He goes to work and very briefly, he's met with a barrage of students and protesters and he gets into an altercation with them, which ends with the Suffolk County Sheriff literally picking him up and carrying him off because it was starting to come to blows. And that was the end of President Pusey's day at Harvard. In contrast, Tom Murphy, um, and the, the note that you'll see here, Professor Tom Murphy, you'll see that this is an unusual kind of professor. He was actually the custodian of the building. And he had a fifth grade education, and he was basically a refugee from Northern Ireland. He had a number of families who had been killed in the violence uh, during that time. And he came to America with very little other than a dream and a sense of purpose. And his purpose, he described very well. He walks up to the students and all the protesters and says, what's going on? And they explain to him the protests and what it's about. And he said, well, this is about freedom of expression, right? And they said, well, yeah. And he said, well, then can I talk? And of course, what could they say? So Tom steps up on the stage, uh, or the stairs rather, and what he doesn't know is that this event is being covered by the New York Times, Boston Globe, and they're even a television camera or two in the background. Um, and he says, I want you to know why I think you should let me go to work today. So he put down his little black metal lunchbox and stands and says, I came here uh, as a refugee. I came here with a very limited fifth grade education. Uh, so I don't have a lot to give, but what I can give is my heart and soul to trying to make this building behind you a clean, bright, inviting environment for other people with the hope that people who are smart and dedicated and caring can build a place where and find ways to deal with conflict in which it doesn't lead to violence. Um, that's what I care about. I want to build a world where we can have differences as we always will, but where we can deal with them in a constructive way in the interest of all of us. Uh, and so if you don't mind, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to go to work. And he bent down and picked up his lunchbox, turned around, and the seas parted. And Tom Murphy went to work that day. Um, and he wasn't cleaning a building. He was creating a better world. And it was a profound lesson for all of us standing there. And many of us, including me, probably didn't fully recognize it at the time, is the power of purpose, that Tom Murphy had a, a sense of moral purpose. Nathan Pusey, frankly, did not. Uh, he had a position. And from that point on, all of us referred to Tom uh, as Professor Tom or Professor Murphy uh, because he was one of our great teachers uh, and taught us about the kind of people we need to be leading um, in the kinds of environments and, and organizations that we want to have for the future. So that's uh, kind of the finale of all this, that purpose-driven leaders um, who have a commitment to other people, uh, a deep well of empathy and a desire to excel, I think build environments where people thrive. And in so doing, all of the other byproducts of organizations, the products, the services, the goods uh, that we hope that generate healthy, vibrant economies are created and sustained over time. So uh, let me close on that point. And uh, there's a few other things we can turn to, but uh, let me be uh, open to questions at this point, if I may, uh, uh, objections or uh, amendments, and uh, let's see where this conversation can go. 
All right. Uh, thank you so much, Professor Gilkey, for a great presentation so far. No objections just yet. I will see if any arise. <laughs> uh, we do have some questions starting to come in. And to all the uh, attendees listening, uh, please do start sending your questions. We'll try to get to as many of them as we can and get you all out of here on time. Um, our first question is coming from Phil, and he wants to return back to the concept of anticipation, which you discussed earlier. And you'd like to understand uh, what are some of the components of anticipation, if you could just uh, share a bit more about this uh, particular concept. Okay, well, um, first of all, a little bit of the history of this. The Club of Rome, which was a, at the time a, a consortium of wealthy industrialists and owners of businesses, I think the average net worth was uh, close to a billion dollars, and they commissioned the study on kind of the future of the globe because they were concerned about the environment, among other things, and overpopulation, big topics that affected all of them. And out of that study, uh, Jay Forrester from MIT did a study and said that the world is going to become a dirtier, drier, more hostile place. Um, and uh, But the, the antidote to that was what he called uh, transnational learning, uh, that the ability to collaborate together to solve problems and move ahead. And when he talked about learning, he said there are three kinds of learning. Uh, one is uh, maintenance learning. So you keep on keeping on. And as Jack Welch said famously, if your organization, if the rate of change and learning of your organization is slower than that of the outside world, the end is near. So maintenance learning is comfortable, but only in the short run. Uh, and what happens ultimately is shock learning, where you're playing a desperate game of catch up with diminished resources. And so the antidote to all that and that dynamic of going back and forth excuse me, back and forth, uh, is what he talked about as anticipatory learning, to be able to see the trends, but then also anticipate the discontinuity in those trends, because you can't extrapolate yourself into the future. In terms of the brain, it means that if you're, you have the capacity to fully do two things. One, use pattern recognition. It's one of our most powerful tools. Uh, and it allows us to aggregate our experience and then understand the implications of it. Again, you don't do that during time of amygdala activation where you're in a flight or fight mode, which is why having, again, safe, secure environments uh, is so critically important. Um, so using pattern recognition, and then interestingly enough, uh, there's another part of the brain that is very quick to respond when there's a question of whether that might be wrong. You know, pattern recognition works really well until it doesn't. And your brain does have built-in ways of sensing when you're off track. And that's usually a part of emotional intelligence in the limbic system, by the way. Um, and understanding that, wait a minute, there may be something wrong here, allows you then to check your own logic, if you will, egocentric bias as an example, um, and then correct in that and be able to say, wait a minute, what you thought was going to happen is probably not going to happen. Let's think about what the options are. And then we have scenario planning or looking at different different options. So it's a very complicated mechanism. Uh, I would argue that it's probably one of the highest skills that and synthesis, looking at opposites and uh, pulling together and integrating the commonalities uh, are probably the, the two most important requirements for an effective senior executive. Okay, great, thank you so much. Um, our next question comes in from Jessica. And Jessica would like to understand if you happen to view male and female leaders differently, specifically on the uh, aspect of does each have strengths as far or weaknesses as far as building effective, healthy, productive, thriving teams? Okay, yeah, good question, Jessica. And yes, um, obviously differences. Uh, let me just talk a little bit about some of the research that we're hoping to do. Um, to respond to Jessica's question, uh, we did a study of um, strategic reasoning and uh, in executive populations. And what we learned was that um, the most proficient strategic thinkers used uh, the emotional reasoning processes in their brain, empathy and, and social perspective taking, uh, to be able to really anticipate how competitors or customers might respond to a strategic initiative. Um, so we realize that this is a you know, critically important uh, skill set. Unfortunately, it was a male population. So turning to the issue of gender, uh, we're, we're wanting to undertake a study. And if anybody's interested in this, I'm happy to help because I don't know whether we're going to get to do it or not. Um, but we have protocols from the first study that are usable. And uh, what we want to do is look at strategic reasoning in women. 
and because we haven't done it, but even more importantly, um, if you look at the number of women in middle management positions, it's been pretty stable for the last decade and a half. Uh, we're talking about 48% roughly of middle managers are female. If you look, as, as all of you know, I'm sure, in the C-suite, it's 2%. And if you're looking at minority women, it's, of course, considerably less than that. Um, and so there's a, there's a glass ceiling, clearly. And we think that the new glass ceiling is around this complaint that we hear on Wall Street, that is, she's not strategic. And the reason for that is twofold, I think. One is just ignorance. And of course, in psychology, anything that's different is considered inferior. So psychology is a male domain or has been. And hopefully we're fixing that, but it needs fixing um, that the norm is not the standard, if you will, in this. Um, and so we have a skewed population of males in there. Um, so what we're looking at then is, is helping people address the problem and so two things. Number one is it's going to be clear women do think strategically. That's obvious, but it's not the same way that men do. And so that's what we really want to document. I've talked to probably a dozen senior neuroscientists in this country about this study. And every single one of them, by the way, most of them are males, say this is going to be fascinating because with women, it's going to be more subtle, it's going to be more nuanced, and it's going to be richer. Uh, and so you know, again, brain science knows this, if you will, that's the hypothesis at least, and it's a good one, I think, um, but we don't practice it in business, and that's that gap that we're trying to address. One of the reasons also it exists is if you look at the career trajectory of women and the kinds of assignments they get, they get an inordinately high number of fix-it turnaround assignments. And I think at the risk of using a sexist sounding phrase, it's a kind of uh, unconscious, maybe intuitive knee-jerk, let mom fix it. Um, and clearly relational men and women have different kind of relationship paradigms, if you will, and again, a generalization, um, but women uh, are called upon clearly to go in, men fix fences, make nice, get people to work together and turn things around. And when they do that, it's all largely a tactical operational relationship oriented process. And then when it turns out the big jobs available and it's seen as more strategic, say, well, she's not ready for that. Well, whose fault is that anyway? Um, so we need to give women more opportunities, and uh, I've been involved in executive programs where that's really been the agenda. Uh, Citibank had a very good one for a number of years to help help people, uh, women, get beyond that level, and it was actually written up in the Wall Street Journal. Uh, and uh, it, it's going to take some real conscious and deliberate efforts um, to to do that. And um, so that's that's maybe a little more personal reaction to Jessica's question. Uh, but yes, there probably are different skill sets, maybe largely from socialization, but maybe from DNA. But whatever they are, you know, we need to create a level playing field so that people's talents are what uh, allow them to achieve, n not their gender or race or other inconsequential kinds of uh, differences. Great, thank you. I imagine that Jessica will find that response very helpful. She did a chat back to mention she is in middle management, and she also volunteered herself for the uh, study that you plan to do in future. Um, All right. <laughs> and that was a great insight. I mean, I'm, I'm simply hearing that it's almost like a self-fulfilling prophecy uh, where women are over and over selected for these uh, types of assignments, and then they're seen as being able to perform that one function, and therefore they're not able to break out and be viewed as strategic because they keep on being uh, pigeonholed in that, that same role. That's, that's really wonderful insight. Yeah, that's right. And one footnote to that, you know, part of what we were coaching for, if you will, was you don't have to, I think women will sometimes feel as though they need to have strategic answers. And uh, uh, we don't think that that's necessarily the case. We think they need to have strategic questions. And so what we did in the Citibank uh, programs is we had women go into breakout groups and come back, well, what are the key strategic questions Citibank ought to be asking about uh, strategically for the future? And they were brilliant. And many of those women carried those questions forward and entered, created conversations that weren't there before and participated and led those conversations. And I think that's one of the ways in which we can uh, start selecting a population that has been underutilized in, in a way that's very much at our own expense. Great. Uh, this next question comes in from Hans, and he'd like to understand uh, what are some of the greatest barriers to creating a brain-friendly organizational environment? Uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's a great question. Um, I think, and th the question is, I think driven by the fact that what we need are leaders with a different kind of mindset. It's really trying to create a different 
view of the of the world um, and uh, business as unusual by Bob Kagan is a, is a very good uh, I think guide to uh, a, a sort of roadmap to how those kinds of leaders need to think of a bit differently. I, I love Jack Welch's comment one time. He said, you know, if you don't have the talent management strategy, you don't have any strategy. You know, and it's so obvious in some sense that if you don't have the people to understand and promulgate uh, the, the strategy, uh, you know, it's just a bunch of overheads in a in a booklet. In fact, uh, there's a saying among strategists, uh, or it's an acronym, SPOT, strategic plans on the shelf. Um, that if you don't pe have people who have the ability to embrace this um, and give it energy and inspire other people, um, by the way, the word inspire comes from Latin inspirare, which means to breathe life into. Um, and the, the people that I know that are doing this effectively really believe in this with their heart and soul. And it becomes very much a part of their purpose of what they're going to build for other people. Um, and here's the good news. While I like to think that this could be driven um, and, and originated in the C-suite, uh, anybody who does this at any part of their organization, if they can't build a corporate culture, they can build a climate, a, a work environment for other people to grow and thrive. And so I think it's incumbent on any of all of us, I include myself in this, to think about building this environment around how do we uh, allow people to flourish? Um, how do we understand how they want to grow and how do we facilitate that and get the barriers out of the way? You know, the politics, again, the, the provincialism, uh, and it's easy to say, and it's very hard to do, and I recognize that. But those are some thoughts. Okay, great. We'll take uh, just two more questions. Uh, this uh, next question comes in from uh, Maricel, and she'd like to understand uh, what are some of the, the first steps necessary to, t to start building a brain-friendly climate or culture, and I'm imagining she's operating uh, in a culture that might not be there just yet. Right. Well, most of us are. So <laughs> that's the first thing. Um, yeah, these are ideal types and there are some examples of them, I think. Um, but I think the first thing that one needs to do in that is just listen. Um, and again, that was the Anne Mulcahy story. By the way, she did the biggest turnaround in corporate history, uh, strategically, I might add, um, in this. But, you know, the story is really listening um, and hearing uh, not only what people are saying, but what they're not saying, you know. Um, and looking where where is the engagement, where's the excitement? Um, on a very pragmatic note, I think the those tell, uh, 10 characteristics that Gallup organization, uh, I'm not trying to be an ad for them, and, and, uh, but, but simply using those 10, you understanding your role, uh, to having conversations about development, that's a great starting place. Um, and um, so I think the argument, it's uh, Cunningham, Marcus Cunningham's book, it's been out for a while, um, and uh, it's not magic, but it gives you kind of 10 dimensions that uh, are associated with building an environment for engagement, which is simply another sign or, of, of an organization that's brain friendly if you're engaged. So those kinds of things, I think, are very useful. Um, another one, actually, and maybe I can go backwards here in the slides. Yeah, let me just uh, this comes out of the Neural Leadership Institute. Can you can you see that, uh, Niatsu? Uh, yeah, we can see the slide. Mm -hmm. Okay, the scarf model is a great starting place and saying, you know, people need to be clear about that they belong, that they, they're important, what their role is, how it's linked to strategy. You know, we always recall the story of the guy with the broom at the Kennedy Space Center who asked what your job said, you know, to put a man on the moon. I mean, having some connection to a greater purpose, to a cause, to a strategy, having some degree of certainty, role clarity is how Gallup talked about it. You know, what am I doing here? Um, autonomy, you know, people want to know what they need to be doing, uh, but they don't need to be told how to do it unless they're an absolute beginner. And then how are we connected to each other? And I, I often think that there's only one, one job description, and that is my job is to help you be more successful. Um, and uh, in fact, one of the most successful CEOs I uh, had the pleasure to work with. I said, when did you kind of catch on to this leadership thing? Because he was so good. And he said, the moment that I realized that I work for the people who report to me. Uh, and, you know, what a great statement. And then ultimately, we want fairness. Um, and it's not just a pay and incentive kind of system, but being treated in a respectful kind of way. Um, and uh, one which uh, reflects the, the greater good and at the same time, individual uh, needs uh, as well. So those are some models that I think you could use to get started. 
the first place I'd start was, does this person really understand their job, not just for next week or next month? And, um, and then do they understand how it's linked to what we're trying to do here uh, and what we're trying to bring to the world, how we want to make a difference? Okay, great. Thank you so much. And this will be the final question uh, and hopefully one that you can help uh, people to go further, essentially. Uh, Sherry and Ron are both looking uh, to understand about more resources. What books might you recommend? What websites, other places can they go train, read, or learn more about what we've been discussing today? Okay, let me ask you a question. Now. Is there a way that I can send something through you to them or does that not work? Uh, yes, um, we do send a follow-up email, uh, including the recording to all attendees, and we can include in that email any recommended resources if you get that to, uh, to us today. Okay, yeah, let me let me do that so that I'm uh, giving it more thought than I will if okay. I'm just kind of shooting from the hip here. Okay. Um, I do think Bob Kagan's work, uh, Business as Unusual, and his work on deliberately developmental organizations, um, is uh, those are, I think, uh, really important reads. Uh, and I'd really recommend his work. Um, I'd look at David Rock's work and just go to the website, the Neural Leadership Institute. Uh, that's where they've really taken up the banner of brain-friendly organizations. Um, their summit conferences, I think, are really quite excellent. Uh, and they're, they're a very interesting research-oriented organization, but they're very much practice-focused uh, in their impact. Uh, so those would be places that I would start and um, I can send a link to a couple of the papers that we've done, uh, one when EQ trumps IQ and strategic reasoning in Harvard Business Review. So I'm happy to, to share that. So I, I will, as I assume that you were being literal, Niatsu, so I will, by the end of the day, send you a list um, for Sherry and Ron to, to look and, and anybody else. All right, sounds good. I did type in the two recommendations you made uh, off the hip uh, into the chat for the audience to see. Uh, Business as unusual and also the Neural Leadership Institute website, uh, at least just the name of it. Um, and so thank you, uh, Professor Gilkey, for a really great, engaging, uh, in-depth presentation, a very thorough response to the questions. Thank you to all attendees uh, who came to join us today. We hope it was worth your while. And hope you'll join us once again when I, the exec, and uh, Emery uh, Goizueta uh, uh, collaborate once again. I'll leave it to you, Professor Gilkey, for any final words. Yeah, thank you. Well, I really appreciate your interest in this, um, and I'm happy to respond. Uh, you, you'll know how to reach me, I think. By the way, the book, I, I didn't give you the exact title. It's an everyone culture um, is, the, is the title of Bob Kagan's book, K-A-G-A-N. Um, but it's been a pleasure, and uh, I look forward to keeping in touch with those of you who would like to do so. And thank you again, Niasu. Okay, great. Take care, everyone. Thank you all. Goodbye. Bye-bye.